There we go. Good afternoon. We're here at Taylor English for Williams Colonels. This is a continuation of our discussion of motions for summary judgment. Uh, today we'll focus on responding to motions for summary judgment and also uh, to some extent on getting, uh, making cross motions for summary judgment or using defensive motions for summary judgment. Uh, further, uh, we'll go into the details of what happens if you don't win or if you do win, what the appeal rights are, etc. Uh, for those out there in the world, this is Taylor English Duma. We are doing a training session here with a lot of my colleagues. We are not sharing legal advice here. Uh, one of the things we do all the time is talk about reading the rules. That would be the Georgia Civil Practice Act and also the Uniform Superior Court Rules or the Uniform State Court Rules. And we do always require you to do your own research, read the rules yourself, read the case law, et cetera, to make sure you're making the right decisions. And of course, if you're not a lawyer, we're not encouraging you to practice law Ill illegally. Uh, we're encouraging you to go to a lawyer who knows how to read the rules. Okay, so last time we had a brief discussion, I believe right towards the end of the session about getting an oral hearing on your motion for summary judgment. And there was some confusion over the exact timing of the request for an oral hearing. So what did I do when I got out of the hearing? I mean, got out of the session? I read the rules. And uh, Uniform Superior Court Rule 6.3 addresses that directly. Uh, and it says that you are entitled to an oral hearing of your motion for summary judgment. And if you are in Georgia State or Superior Court and you're moving for summary judgment, uh, when do you have to file a request for an oral hearing? You have to file it with your motion for summary judgment. Okay, if you're responding to a motion for summary judgment and you want a, an oral hearing, uh, when do you have to file that by? Well, that's where the confusion was. It has to be filed within five days of the time your response is due. And actually, I should say, within five days after your response is filed. So if you file early, earlier than the response is actually due, you have to file your request for oral hearing within five days of that date. Of course, with so many other things, I recommend you go ahead and file it with your response so you don't forget to do it later. It's sort of like a demand for a jury trial. You just want to make sure it's filed timely Go ahead and file it so you can forget about it. Now, there would be the question of if you're moving for summary judgment, would you want an oral hearing or not? What would be the disadvantages of having an oral hearing? Any thoughts? All right, Mr. Devine, Corey Devine thinks there's no disadvantage. If it's worth filing a motion, it's worth getting in front of the judge and arguing. Anybody disagree with that? Well, I don't disagree, but I would say it's more cost to the client because then they had to pay you to, pre to prepare the motion and not pay you to prepare for oral argument. Okay. Wouldn't that be one of the advantages of an oral hearing? <laughs> yeah. As lawyers, if it's more expensive for the client, that means it's more money for us, right? Delete that. <laughs> uh, Henry, if you're looking for summary judgment on a question of law, I can see where you would not want to try to lend credence to the other side's position that there were fact disputes by showing up and getting into the getting out there into the swamp and arguing over what's in the record and what it means and so on and so forth and taking the position that this is a pure matter of law and that oral argument isn't necessary i've done that in the past okay well i agree that there are pluses and minuses i agree with paul I don't agree that it's always great to ask for an oral argument if you're the moving party because if it is supposed to be a really straightforward determination, particularly as a matter of law on undisputed facts, sometimes what I find out is the other side can come in and basically share a lot of falsities with the judge, point out things that aren't in the record, make arguments or statements about what's supposedly in the record that's not actually in the record. Uh, and it can get uh, to the point where the judge will just say, sounds like a question of fact to me, and deny summary judgment. So 
I think you need to think long and hard about whether, particularly whoever your opponent is as the lawyer, about whether they're just going to muck things up and whether if they do muck them up, you're going to be able to get it unscrambled in the judge's head during the limited time you have to argue your motion for summary judgment. Well, the, if you're the moving party and you don't ask for an oral argument and the other side doesn't ask, are you prepared to live with the fact that it's going to go on briefs? If you write a darn good brief. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the, the, now one of the advantages of having an oral argument is who can come to an oral argument. Your client can come, your client can see the judge. You might be able to see the judge for the first time after filing the lawsuit. You may not know that judge really well. You might want to get an eyeball on who the judge is and what they're like before the, uh, before the trial comes up because some judges don't hold scheduling conferences and all that. Your client can get a more realistic, if it's a really close question, your client can get a more realistic view of what the case may be like if you're getting uh, grilled by the judge on various topics. Uh, and particularly if it's something where the, there's reasonableness involved or something like that, the, uh, the client may, it might be helpful for you down the road for the client to see the judge asking questions about how could your client possibly have decided to do that this way or whatever. Uh, now, one other issue about an oral argument is Sometimes judges don't want to stick within the bounds of what the summary judgment is. And very often they will try to seek concessions out of the lawyers. They have nothing to do with the, or they may have something to do with the motion that's before the court. But they may try to get evidence in, for lack of a better description, by art, by the lawyers making admissions that aren't on the record. Like I had one where it was our position that the plaintiff had not notes, this is one we used in the last session, had not submitted a proper motion for summary judgment. I tried to move for summary judgment on three different notes for three different parties at one time, and they had not supported their, their motion adequately by evidence. They had omitted certain evidence in its entirety that was necessary to avoid this usury issue that we were asserting. And uh, the judge attempted to get me to agree to various things. Um, you know, agree, don't you agree there is a security deed even though no evidence has been presented? Don't you agree it's a first priority security deed even though I've never seen it before? They're saying there is one. Is there one, Mr. Quillian? Well, you know, as a lawyer arguing and to defend the motion for summary judgment, you're not there to cough up facts to support the other side and agree to things that they haven't put in the record. And so, but judges, the best, the, way, the best way a judge can get rid of issues of fact is to get the lawyers representing the parties to agree to things that otherwise might be in dispute. And so, there are risks uh, about being before a judge. In fact, let's say you move for summary judgment based on a request for admissions. That let's say the other side failed to respond to requests for admissions and you move for summary judgment based on those. A judge may try to pound it out of you that you ought to withdraw your, your motion because isn't it just unfair for you to move for summary judgment based on the admissions made by their failure to respond or something like that. And it, or alternatively, it gives the other side an, an extra chance to come in and move to withdraw the admissions, perhaps. So they're just risks being before a judge, but then there also are benefits. Now, uh, we talked about... Uh, a little bit last time about the possibility of the judge determining that summary judgment as moves for should not be granted. Does a judge have the has have within their arsenal the possibility of granting partially what has been asked for? Yes. The answer is yes. And what rule is that? When in doubt. <laughs> When in doubt, read the rules. Okay. Uh, 9-11-56-D talks about cases that are partially adjudicated on summary judgment. Uh, and the judge can basically parse things, if you read the rule, any way they deem to be practical based on the presentation of evidence that's been made 
and the motions that have been asserted. I don't think a judge should pull something just out of the blue on their own, although they can make a motion on their own based on the evidence presented. Uh, but they would have to give, if they were just pulling something out of the blue, they won't resolve this not part of the motion for summary judgment. I think they would have to give a party the opportunity to respond. Uh, but they could, if they look at the facts and they don't see anything contested with respect to certain things, they can make individual decisions, maybe as to components of a claim, uh, maybe as to an entire claim, but not all the claims. And then they can... Uh, find facts that are not substantially in dispute uh, and limit the ability of the parties down the road to continue to litigate over those. I think it's worthwhile reading what this says out loud because it's probably provides some more flexibility to the judge than you might think. Uh, let's see what it says. It says, case is not fully adjudicated on motion. If on motion under this code section, judgment is not rendered upon the whole case or for all relief asked and the, tri and the trial is necessary, the court at the hearing of the motion, referring to a motion for summary judgment, by examining the pleadings and the evidence before it and by interrogating counsel, <laughs> see, <laughs> risk, risk of, uh, risk of uh, being at a hearing, uh, shall, if practicable, excuse me, if, yes, if practicable, not if practical, something different, uh, ascertain what material facts exist without substantial controversy and what material facts are actually and in good faith controverted. So a judge, theoretically, at a hearing could attack your good faith in asserting a factual position and uh, essentially browbeat you into making a concession if you're not careful. Uh, there may be facts that just don't sound to the judge like this is the way it actually happened, but it's quite possible that if you had a trial on the issue, that's the way it actually happened. Uh, uh, it shall thereupon, meaning the court, shall thereupon make an order specifying the facts that appear without substantial controversy, including the extent to which the amount of damages or other relief is not in controversy and directing such proceedings in the action as are just. So all of a sudden the judge is making justness decisions. Upon the trial of the action, the facts so specified shall be deemed established and the trial shall be conducted accordingly. So be aware that that is also a risk that can arise when moving for summary judgment. You might move for summary judgment, not ask for an oral argument. The other side responds, ask for an oral hearing, and then the judge comes in and tries to eliminate facts that would be subject to trial, whereas you might really want those facts to be tried and first heard before the jury, rather than having the judge just read the facts to the jury, because sometimes it's seedy evidence or whatever that get, get a jury fired up. So um, take that into consideration. Now, if you're responding to a motion for summary judgment, let's assume the, the plaintiff or the movement Cites all sorts of cases that sound really good based on the quotations they pulled out of the case. How do you go about, as the respondent, hashing through whether those cases actually say what the movement is saying they say? Read them. Yeah, first of all, you need to read the cases, right? Uh, uh, and you want to make sure they're not just citing head notes they pulled out of Westlaw that have nothing to do with the actual facts of the case or the holding of the case. You've got to identify what the procedural status was of each case that they're citing. It might not be a summary judgment case. It might be a motion to dismiss. It might be a, a motion to overrule a directed verdict or, or who knows what the, uh, the case, the procedural status might be or what the, uh, the standard of review that was being applied by the judge uh, who was uh, deciding that case was required to implement. Let's assume that uh, you had a multi-party case cited against you and it sounded as the other side purported it to be that it just sounds really good for their position and you're trying to figure out how can I convince the judge that the case they've cited is actually different from what 
they're saying it is and or different from the fact situation that I have for my case. What could you use to persuasively show the judge that that case is really an apposite to your situation? What sort of tools could you use? What's the most fundamental tool you would use? You're on brief. Words, yes. <laughs> Words in your brief, yes. <laughs> and that's what a lot of people think of as, as uh, briefs, you know, as, as the way uh, motions for summary judgment are, are done. It's just a, a plain old word brief. Uh, what else might you do to get in front of the judge that which you would want to have before the judge in order to defeat the motion for summary judgment. Affidavits, documents, deposition right. testimony. Okay, so yes, that sort of goes back to what we talked about last time. You want to make sure you got admissible evidence in to distinguish the facts of the case from what they're asserting. Uh, how about putting evidence actually in your brief? A photo or of the brief of the, the evidence that the other side is saying says one thing, when in fact, you know if the judge actually sees the document, it says something else. Can you do that? Can you do that these days? <coughs> Put a, a, a picture, of the, picture of the evidence inside your brief? Yes, we can. Okay, yes, you can. Uh, now, how about, how about this? Can you, if you really want the judges to actually read the cases, what can you do in your response brief? You can attach copies of the cases in the appendix. And uh, in fact, there's a judge on the Superior Court of Fulton County named Miss Jackson Bedford. And he actually asked you to attach at least all important cases, maybe not every string site, uh, to your brief when you're either moving for summary judgment or responding. And I call that a Bedford brief. And, and I like to use Bedford briefs a lot if the cases are actually good for me. Uh, because you want to give them every opportunity to read them. Now, how about with respect to those cases? What if it's multi-party cases, numerous claims going every which way among all the parties, and you're trying to focus on a particular claim within this spectrum of claims that's between two of the parties uh, and all the other ones that are irrelevant? What can you do to make that case come alive if you, if you can distinguish it based on the facts of the case? Well, if you didn't attach the case, you can highlight where you want the judge to read. Yeah, you can highlight. That, that gets them to the point you want them to read. That's right. You can also do uh, diagrams of the case. You can do graphical diagrams where you have, uh, you know, arrows and triangles and things going various directions with notations regarding which claims are against which parties and how they affect each other, whether uh, <coughs> Something established against one party is somehow raised judicata against another party or issued preclusion. Uh, and so I've, I've had briefs where I've had lots of different diagrams attached to the, to the brief, and that would be both moving for summary judgment if you're trying to show how of all these cases, ours is exactly like this one. You can diagram both the case you're relying on and the case that you're uh, that you're relying on, in case you're relying on in the facts of your own case and you can lay them over each other, you can show they're exactly the same. Or you can do it as a response. And uh, sometimes the judges really love that because otherwise, if there are lots of parties, lots of claims, they have to somehow read through these cases and break them down and figure out what's actually against whom and who submitted evidence about what. Uh, There's also an interactive brief too. I don't know whether anybody's use those, but now you can hyperlink hyperlink, and you can embed in the case, you just submit the case on a, on a DVD, for example, you've got your brief and all whoever's reading the brief needs to do is click on and it's a part of the DVD and it jumps immediately to the case or the page or it can be from your record. So, I mean, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's a, all the judges that I've talked to like that if they if they have a complicated case like that. You can actually these days have a link inside the brief that jumps to the video deposition testimony of the person you're yeah. trying to assert gives rise to the question of material fact. And sometimes it does actually stick in that judge's mind a lot better if they see a person actually saying uh, whatever the, the testimony is that you're relying on. Now 
Henry, one of the things I've done is, is I'll, I'll, I'll have two columns, one with what the individuals saying the case says, misquoting it, and one with what the actual case says. And, and if I find a, a opposing counsel who's taken liberty with facts or with cases, then just say, opposing counsel, you know, here's what he says, that uh, the, the witness claimed that he didn't see the car in front of him. And deposition, actual deposition quote, I saw the car in front of me. And, I'm, I just, and I'll go down, and, and I've had cases where I've made uh, 15 or 20 dif distinctions between what the one counsel, opposing counsel said and what the truth is. I think that may be effective to. And then you could copy the deposition pages right. to show right. the court. And that shows great confidence on behalf of the lawyer who does a chart like that because they're saying, here's the testimony and here's the testimony. Here's the, uh, to me, that's, if I was a judge, that would be persuasive. The other thing is, I was thinking about with respect to cases. Let's say you had a series of cases with slightly distinguishable facts, but the same claim, or alternatively, uh, slightly different claims. You can actually do a chart, so like you, you know, you see if you look at software sales brochure, and it'll have like a, a vertical line, a side column that has all the different attributes of the software, and it'll have three or four different competing brands next to each mm -hmm. other, and they'll have check boxes and dots, and some of them you can uh, actually utilize that to show, well, this case, here's my case over here, it's got checks all the way down, and here's the case I'm relying on, it's got checks all the way down, but the cases they're relying on, you've only got to check every so often. Uh, any way you can bring it alive for the judge can be very helpful. And of course, what, what can you use if, if you have an oral argument? What can you use? Or even if you want to put it in your brief, if you've got a fact, complicated fact situation. Demonstrative aids like? <laughs> PowerPoints. Poster boards. Poster boards. What's a really basic one? Photographs. Photographs. Copies. Timelines. Yeah. Uh, to try to unscramble it, because you've been living and breathing this case through all these depositions and everything. The judge may be looking at it for the first time, maybe if you're lucky, the night before the oral argument. <laughs> Whereas it may be, but maybe the first time they hear about it is when you show up. You know. The, the situation where you've got a construction case and the judge says, you know, Jones versus Smith, isn't this the car wreck case? Uh, then you know you've got your work cut out for you, regardless of which side of the motion you're on. Uh, okay, now what in Georgia, what is a powerful tool for eliminating a case? that's cited against you that would be perfect for the other side. I'll give you a hint. Physical it has something precedent. to do with the number of judges. Physical precedent. Physical precedent. What the heck is that? Two the court of rule. Yeah, two to one in the Court of Appeals. Okay, so you normally have a three-judge panel in the Court of Appeals, right? And if only two of them vote in favor of the majority opinion, <coughs> then what good is that case as far as precedent? The rule, the Court of Appeals rules say it's physical precedent only. Yeah, but, but what, what in the world does that mean? That means you can physically hold it in your hand or? It means the Court of Appeals can cite it when they want to or when they don't want to. I think that's what the rule is. <laughs> okay, it's not supposed to be binding authority, right, on the trial courts. So sometimes you need to pull that one out of your, your quiver uh, to knock a case that looks particularly bad for your position out of the out of the park uh, for when you're arguing in the trial court. So let's repeat that because it's, it's it's a weird thing that you're not going to know about and if you haven't been practicing for a while. It's called physical precedent, and it's when only two judges of the court of appeals vote for the majority opinion that's being cited against you. You can, as a responding party, say that case isn't worth anything. And might as well just be completely ignored because it's not binding precedent in Georgia. And the source for that is the Court of Appeals rule? Mr. Boyle, do you know? Oh. Yeah, it's the Court of Appeals rule. And cases. I mean, it's cited yeah. in cases. That but I guess the thing to look at, I guess, from, from either perspective, whether you're the one who's using the case or the one who's going against it, it, 
if you find a case like that, and you, you may think this is a great case, and then you look at it more closely and you see the two to one, you go darn. But um, often you'll shepherdize those cases and you'll see the Court of Appeals then relied on that case in six or seven other cases. Okay. <laughs> so, and maybe this particular case has got the great quote you want to use. Um, so I think you can still use it. I think you need, you need to acknowledge in your brief the physical precedent, but then say the Court of Appeals has also, you know, later relied on this case. Well, the other thing you can do is you, you might look at the uh, judges who were on the, in the majority, and uh, those particular judges on the Court of Appeals might have taken an opinion in a, in a case where all three judges voted in favor of the majority. And uh, you can say, well, obviously, the other two new judges agreed with the other judge that's, that wrote the physical precedent opinion. So you can do all sorts of things if you get to the Court of Appeals or ways to argue around uh, whether, at a minimum, the court's going to go this way, whether they ever have or not, uh, based on breaking down the cases. So that's, that's definitely one to remember is physical precedent. All right, now let's assume that you, you've had motion, you're the plaintiff, you've had summary judgment moved against you and you're sweating bullets. Uh, you're con extremely concerned that your client's case as originally pounded is gonna go up in smoke because of this motion for summary judgment. Are you necessarily dead in the water? No, they haven't been granted. No, you can dismiss the case. You can bail out, I think, twice in state court and uh, refile it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Let well, refile. Jimmy Butler does that all the time. <laughs> well, uh, well, what good does that do you? If you're going to lose on summary judgment one time, you're going to lose yeah. on summary judgment the next time. you facts. Okay, well, yeah. All right, so I was going to say, yeah, what, if during, what if you filed the case and you thought, well, this is what happened, and then during discovery you found out that this and that happened? What about the that? Can you do anything? If you're going to lose on the this, what do you do with the that? You can amend your complaint. Almost almost all the time in state court, unless a pretrial order has been entered, uh, you can amend your complaint uh, without leaving court. And so you might be able to assert a new claim, possibly even a better one, that didn't exist or you didn't know about it at the time you, you, uh, moved for, uh, you originally brought the complaint. Let's assume that you thought the negligent misrepresentation that was made was actually fraud uh, because somebody has made an admission during the course of discovery uh, or something of that nature. There, there are ways to avoid having total summary judgment entered against you. Of course, you have to apply all the same standards that you would use in whether you bring the case in the first instance. Uh, but that's a way of sidestepping getting thrown out of court altogether most for summary judgment, or you could dismiss the case, try to go find a judge who you don't think, you know, well, file, file again, see if you get a judge you don't think is as uh, a good of a jurist who's going to let it go to trial anyway, and then hopefully the jury will find it in your favor, and then everything will be found in, this, in favor of the way the jury found it. Uh, but then so, if you're on the other side, you just ask that the, the case be reassigned to the judge that had it previously, if it's in the same court. You can ask that. Yeah. That's not necessarily going to happen. Yeah, that's local court to court. And um, <clears throat> we found situations where people would file in state court the first time through and then come back and file the same case in superior court or vice versa. Yeah. If you do it more than one time, won't they kind of see what you're doing? The pad, they'll figure out that you're just trying your judge jumping. Everybody knows what you're doing anyway. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter. You're allowed to do it. As long as you can do it. <laughs> now, I don't really want to go into this now because I'm not thoroughly prepared on it, but can you, I think you can dismiss one less time now than you were able to earlier. So don't dismiss more than once without doing what? <clears throat> Breathe the rules. <laughs> Make sure the okay. second one is not with prejudice. Yeah. yeah, so. Whether you say it or not. Yeah, because you don't want to dismiss it twice and then realize that you only had an opportunity to re uh, dismiss it and renew once. Uh, now, uh, what if you get to the point, all right, so you got this motion for summary judgment and you thought it was a dead bang winner, you thought you had a Supreme Court case right on point. Your facts, you've done your charts, all the facts match up. 
all the elements of the cause of action match up, but the judge uh, denies it. First of all, what do you do? As a, as a well, it doesn't matter. You're a, you know, let's say you're the plaintiff, you move for summary judgment. You could ask for a um, certificate of immediate review. Uh, now, you step outside, you say a few expletives, then you ask. <laughs> and, uh, all right, so you could ask for a certificate of immediate review. Should you do that? If the court, let's say, announces from the bench, I'm denying your motion for summary judgment. When should you take advantage of the opportunity to ask for a certificate of immediate review? You can do it within 10 days of the entry of the actual order. When do you have to have a certificate of immediate review yeah, yeah. entered? Yeah, you gotta, you gotta have it entered by the trial court within 10 days of the entry of the original order. Okay, so if you asked on the 10th day, you would be playing with what? Fire. 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 <laughs> uh, so that there's one, you can try to probe as to whether the court, uh, there's some risk to asking the court right then and there will you grant a certificate of immediate review because the judge might be already so heavily against you without having sat back and thought that he'll, they'll, the trial judge will just say no. But you better uh, get on it real quickly because if you want to appeal to the Court of Appeals or to the Supreme Court, as the case may be, based on a certificate of immediate review granted after a denial of motion for summary judgment. It's a jurisdictional issue for the Court of Appeals of the Supreme Court. If you don't have that certificate of immediate review actually entered in the trial court within 10 days, then the appellate court cannot take the appeal. And Still don't have to. Yeah. That's right. We'll get, yeah, we'll get to that, but it's, they absolutely cannot take it if you don't file it within and have it entered. What does entered mean, by the way? File with the clerk. So it has to be signed by who first? By the judge. By the judge. And of course, the judge, you, you might ask if you're at the hearing uh, and you don't necessarily want to immediately ask the court for a certificate of immediate review. You may or may not. Depends on sort of what the judge has said during the hearing. If the judge has said, this is a really, really close question of a great importance uh, in Georgia law, but I'm denying your motion for summary judgment, you might say, can I have one now? But you certainly, while you're there with the judge, you never know when you can get to communicate with him again. Are you going on vacation? Are you going to be here tomorrow? You know, how you feeling? <laughs> Etc. Because you're going to have to get that certificate of media review really quickly. And, excuse me? I was just saying, how busy are you? Yeah. <laughs> if it's questionable, can you have it prepared at the time and get it done immediately sure. right now? Yeah, you could have it. You could have a document prepared. Uh, and then there may have been some indication by the court yeah, handwriting. of the importance. If there are a bunch of reporters in the, in the courtroom, then it might be one that's in a particularly uh, interesting subject matter. All right, so if you did do that, how would you... How would you actually appeal the case? <coughs> First of all, you would. You, once you file your your certificate, then you got to file a notice of appeal within, I think it's 30 days of the entry of the order from which you're appealing. Eh. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so, when in doubt, read the rules. Read the rules. Okay. Uh, 9 11, uh, excuse me. OCGA 5634B. By the way, that was rather. Uh, I, I, I applaud anybody who ventures to answer because the only way I know this for sure is because I read the rules right before I came down here. And there was only one portion of the of the uh, statement that was incorrect. So please forgive my. Thank, thank, thank you for not totally embarrassing me. <laughs> Okay, so you get this certificate of immediate review filed with the trial court, right? Yep. And that's after it's been signed by the judge. And under OCJ 5634B, uh, I believe it says that you have 10 days after such certificate is granted, which theoretically I suppose could be a different day than on which it is entered. Let's say the judge signs it at 5 p.m. one day, enters it the next. Uh, 
to file an application for discretionary appeal at the court to which you must or may appeal. And of course, like any other application for discretionary appeal, you're going to have to make it in the sense of a petition as they describe it. You're going to have to include the uh, rec parts of the record you think are necessary for the uh, appellate court to determine whether uh, the they should take the appeal, which would of course include your what? If it's the denial of a motion for summary judgment. It's going to include the order for sure. And it's going to include the mo probably your motion and your brief. And, uh, and you will argue that you know, this is important for the uh, appellate court to go ahead and decide because of all these different reasons. Now, what would a trial court use in determining whether a certificate of immediate review would be a good idea or not? Whether they want to fool with the case yeah. or not. Yeah, they might want to get it off their desk right now and hopefully it'll be wandering around in pellet land for a year or so and then they'll retire and somebody else will deal with the trial. <laughs> or uh, let's assume that if, since summary judgment is not granted, now all of a sudden it's going to be a six week trial that's going to totally mess up the court's calendar. They may decide, oh, if, if, although I can't in good conscience agree with the movement, Maybe the Court of Appeals will, and I'll never have to worry about this case again, uh, except for entering the judgment on remand. Uh, uh, so, yes? Henry, is the application for discretionary appeal that you file within 10 days the same thing as the appellate brief? Or do you wait to hear from the court whether they're going to grant the appeal, and then will they give you a briefing schedule? No, it's, it's the latter. The what if you if you're successful in filing your petition or application for immediate uh, for excuse me discretionary appeal, then the, the appellate court I believe has court of appeals has 45 days to decide that. Okay. Once they decide, they will issue an order saying we'll accept this appeal, and then you have 30 days to file your notice of appeal. They'll send you a letter with your case number. All the details. Okay. Tell you what to do. And then your briefing in the court of appeals starts. All right. Then the okay. briefing starts. Okay. So once so. you file your, uh, so yeah. if you have 30 days to file your notice of appeal, that's filed where? The trial court. At the trial court. And then all the things have to happen that would normally happen in an appeal, like the clerk has to get the record together. You have certain elements that you have to prove in your application, such as a prima facie showing in order to get. The court of appeals to grant it. What, what's your burden? Well, your okay. Your first burden, I'm just reviewing this basically, is that because I didn't mention it earlier, the trial court is supposed to determine that the issue of is such, the issue is of such importance to the case that immediate review should be had. Okay. okay, that's one thing, and that's the trial judge, and then the application uh, should. Uh, <coughs> I think you would have to make a prima facie showing that the trial judge was incorrect in their motion, I mean, in their decision. Now, not, not break the whole thing, but enough to show they totally misread a case or, in fact, they ignored the Supreme Court case you cited or, or something, and then also reasons why this will make all the difference in the world to the case below, uh, and, and you know, such as elimination of a lot of parties or a lot of judicial efficiency. Yes, sir, Todd. Uh, if you are the party, the non movement who defeated this summary judgment, and you don't want the case to go up to the Court of Appeals, what, what can you file and what's your timing for opposing the request for a certificate of immediate appeal and uh, et cetera, whatever is filed at the Court of Appeals? Okay, well, with respect to the certificate of immediate review, you're going to have very limited opportunities, probably maximum 24 hours, if you even get it in time, to somehow convince the trial judge that this wasn't really important and you really shouldn't certify. That would be generally the trial judge is going to just do whatever they're going to do. They're not going to right. hear the right. other side. But you do get the opportunity to brief in the court of appeals to respond there, urging them not to take it. Yes, yes, you would have the ability to attack the application. 
Uh, now, let me point out something I think is important that I believe all of us need to know that if you file an application for discretionary appeal, including a petition as they refer to for some reason under this particular rule, there is a little segment here that I think may well be extremely important. I would certainly not want to get it wrong. Uh, it says, uh, and sh this is referring to the, the application, shall be served upon the opposing party or parties, in this case, in the manner prescribed by Code Section 5632, except that such service shall be perfected at or before the filing of the application. Now, one, I think your certificate has to say that you perfected service at or before the filing of the application. And technically, I think you could interpret that to mean you need to hand deliver it to the other side who's going to only have 10 days to respond uh, before you actually go to the Court of Appeals and file it at the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court, as the case may be. Uh, and I think they do that because you have such limit. If you dropped it in the mail and it took five days to get there, the poor other side's going to have a great difficulty timely responding. You're talking about responding in the trial court level to, to dissuade the trial court from granting this? No, no, no. I'm talking about if you file an application with the Court of Appeals for, for a discretionary appeal. You have that, 10 days to respond to it as, as in somebody who's opposing it. But you yes. have to serve it on your opponents before you file it, almost like a, a subpoena in federal court. You've got to that's, that's the way I read that yeah. rule, and certainly the intent of the rule is to give the other side the full 10 days to evaluate it and to respond. And, I, and frankly, I see appellate lawyers acting like that's not in there all the time. I've never really understood it. Uh, you know, the, they'll take the position that you drop it in the mail before you before you file it at the Court of Appeals, that that's adequate. I don't know exactly what the answer is. All I know is I want, don't want to find out I'm wrong. So uh, I uh, am more likely to want to go ahead and hand deliver it to the opposing side. Now, sometimes that well, it should be generally possible unless the people are just far flung all over the place. Uh, and you can always, of course, send it by email or something these days just to make darn sure you did something now that's not proper service, but if you did it properly and sent it by email, at least they can't complain they didn't know about it. Okay, so we'll deal with it later as if the Court of Appeals takes it and all that. And, uh, and just, just, but just out of interest, what way would a Court of Appeals review a motion for summary judgment? Abuse of discretion? De Nova. So that would mean they're supposed to look at the record as if they were the trial court, mm -hmm. look at it all over again, figure out whether, what, which way the judgment should be entered. Uh, and sometimes the court of appeals can break, you know, break down what should have been granted and what shouldn't have been granted in a similar way, so long as that's what's been appealed. Or they can affirm for entirely different reasons. That's right. And uh, if, even if the trial court got it wrong, if, if they can find some other independent grounds that would uphold the judgment, they can, they can do it. And, and what's that called? Right for any reason. Right for any reason rule. So we've, <laughs> we've talked about physical precedent. We've talked about the right for any reason rule. Right? They can, they can also decide they made a mistake in letting it be appealed to them and just enter one paragraph. We made a mistake. Yes, they and definitely made a mistake. Wow, you had it happen? Yeah. Wow. Wasted eight months, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it so, so that's what that's what happened that it gets up to appeal. So let's assume let's assume that uh, let's assume you're the movement for summary judgment and you've succeeded on a couple of your grounds for moving for summary judgment, maybe two out of three claims, uh, and, and it's granting you a hundred million dollars. Uh, what might you want to do uh, with respect to winning two thirds of the case? You can, you can uh, ask for an entry of a 54B order 
granting final judgment on parts of your case and separate, entering judgment on that part and leaving the rest or dismiss the rest. Okay, so under Rule 911.54b, you can ask for the entry of final judgment. What is the uh, standard by which the trial judge should look at that request? Um, I think it's discretionary, it, just in terms of what's in the, in the efficiency of justice. Okay, so. But that's off the top of my head, I haven't read the rules. Let's read the rules. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's put it this way, I think Foy is right in every respect, but he just didn't use the exact words there in the rule. Uh, so under 911.54b, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the judge should determine uh, whether there is no just reason for delay. Uh, so, for instance, if you had a tort claim and you're suing the person for a tort claim, for uh, at the same time you're suing them for breach of a, of a note, uh, the judge might find in the in favor of you as the movement on the note claim, but find there's a genuine issue of material fact with respect to the tort claim. And so the judge may say, well, it's obvious that the defendant owes this money to the plaintiff. My trial calendar is gonna be, you know, I'm not gonna get on the trial for another uh, six months. So there's no just reason for me to delay the efforts of the plaintiff in collecting the note so I find there's no just reason for delay and then I'm going to enter a final judgment on the note. Henry, in the non-movement, say you got a three count case and summary judgment is granted against the non-movement on one count, can they immediately appeal the grant of summary judgment on that one count and hold up the rest of the case? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, nope. it's not a final judgment. If, it's, yep. if it is a final judgment or if it's not a final judgment? Yes, well, summary judgment is granted on count one Two and three, they find fact issues for trial. You still have to have a 54B to go on appeal on that. That's my belief, and I, I, I totally affirm. We have, we have a dissenting vote over here. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? Well, I think, sure. I mean, I've just gone through this in some cases. 911.56H um, allows you to go up on any count. The summary judgment is granted on any count. <clears throat> You know, what happens at the trial level with the rest of the case is another question. But. Yeah, it does, in fact, say, I mean, I, I read this, and I was wondering whether it was with or without my, because uh, I've actually got a case for this situation, but 91156H, referred to by Mr. Boyle, uh, says, an order granting summary judgment on any issue or as an, to any party shall be subject to review by appeal. It doesn't say when. Uh, and it says an order denying summary judgment shall be subject to review by direct appeal in accordance with subsection B of code section 5634, which is what we just read. So you go about uh, the same way. Yeah, I thought you could but, appeal. So that certainly says you can appeal. Well, I just do don't do know what it says when you can. What do you do with 54B, though? Because it says that you can only appeal when less than all, I mean, with, you have to get permission when less than all claims and all counts are. Well, does 54B only go to your ability to go ahead and start collecting? Well, here's how I see the 54B work. You can get trapped by this. If, uh, if 54B order is entered on fewer than all claims, right. that then starts the time for an appeal. So if you're the losing party, on that order, you have to appeal right then. You can't wait for the end of the case. Right. So if you lose on count one, you can take it up right then, or not. If there's a 54B order, yeah. you better take it up, or you're going to lose your opportunity to appeal. Does it stay the rest of the case? If I appeal, I don't think it does automatically. Say I have no 54B and I appeal on count one, and no. I've got a right of appeal under Rule 56. What happens to the rest of the case? I think it stays. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's yeah. taken away from the trial judge. I think the trial court may lose jurisdiction with the file of notice of appeal. Mm -hmm. I do too. So, I, I don't actually know the answer to that. So, let's read the case law and come back next time. <laughs> well, that's, uh, I mean, it sounds like Don has successfully taken appeals 
Well, I mean, I've seen, I've seen it happen. I've sort of been around all sides of this thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, for example, we had a case in August where the judge granted a summary judgment of liability, but he said he wasn't sure about damages and he wanted to have a second hearing on damages. Well, before we could do that, the other side filed a notice of a, an appeal on, on the liability order. And I went okay. back and checked the cases, and so they definitely had the right to do that. Okay, they okay. Stay the trial. Yeah. yeah, and the judge and the judges. I mean, I looked into whether so the, the case is to answer the question as to when. This order granting summary judgment on any issue shall be subject to review by appeal, which is not expressly stated in 1156. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think John's right. Okay, so that could obviously muck you up if you were the plaintiff and uh, you got a uh, part, let's say one third of, let's say you got the smaller summary judgment on the smaller part of your case. And the big part, you would, otherwise we're going to go to trial next week, uh, and the other side appeal. Because if it does, in fact, as it should, especially if, unless this, unless the case can be severed, uh, then you're going to end up trying it all at once. Maybe if you had the note and the car wreck in the same case, you could ask for a severance. But you might want to do that before your summary judgment is entered. So that only one half of the case goes up. Mm -hmm. So uh, what if you both sides filed summary judgment against each other and neither side won anything? Where do you end up? You got to try. <laughs> right. What might have happened in the interim? Could have settled. Could have settled. You might have found out a lot about the case that you didn't know because of uh, people coughing up evidence and facts that you didn't know about in, in, in the attempt to defeat the other side's motion for summary judgment. Uh, but does the denial of summary judgment by the judge prejudice you in any way? No. No, it doesn't. Because right. the jury's not going to know they denied the summary judgment. I mean, so... It's right. not going to sway them one way or the other. And there are no inferences that arise by reason of that denial, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, mm -hmm. while on the one hand you can end up being interrogated by the judge in an oral argument, uh, on the flip side, if you lose a motion for summary judgment, it's not supposed to. Okay. Uh, if you move, lose a motion for summary judgment you have made, it's not supposed to prejudice you if you lose. Uh, obviously, if uh, you lose a summary judgment that is made against you, it can be extremely prejudicial. <laughs> uh, okay, well that actually pretty much covers what we were gonna try to cover today, unless there are any other topics on summary judgment that you wanna raise. One over here. You wanna talk briefly, if you haven't already, about, you have the brief and the motion, but under the state court rules, you have to also file a statement of, if you're the movement, a statement of material facts, not a dispute, what response does the non-movement get to that? And there's also something called statement of theories of recovery, which I've never understood exactly what those are. But I think you still have to file those in state court. Okay, we're talking about Superior Court Rule uh, 6.5. <coughs> and uh, let's just read it here and see if we can figure out what it is. Upon any motion for summary judgment pursuant to the Georgia Civil Practice Act, there shall be an annexed to the notice of motion a separate, short, and concise statement of each theory of recovery and of each of the material facts as to which the moving party contends there is no genuine issue, of it, issue to be tried. The response shall include a separate, short, and concise statement of each of the material facts as to which it is contended there exists a genuine issue to be tried. So, first of all, is it part of your brief? No, no it's no. a separate document. It's a separate, it's a separate document. document. Uh, <laughs> annex to the notice of motion. I think it's usually, I usually see it as an entirely separate document. How about y'all? So, yeah, I think you just. Uh, so you would have the motion saying this is what we want. You'd have, theoretically, I guess you could attach this thing because that's what the rule says. Most of the time it's a separate document. 
which is a statement of undisputed material facts as to which there's no issue, genuine issue to be tried and theory of recoveries. And then there is uh, the brief. All right, so let's assume that, I guess, the statement of theory of recovery is basically a, a, a reader's digest version of why you should win uh, and on what claims. Generally, it's yeah, I think it's just a couple of paragraphs. Yeah, I think it's just intended to give the judge and the clerk a quick view of what the case is all about. Condensed yes. Yeah. All right. Yeah. And then a cheat sheet, basically. This, this is the one that the judge picks up. <laughs> That's when immediately before the hearing, when he thinks it's the car wreck and it's really the construction case. Uh, the statement of material facts is not supposed to be every fact that the people don't think is contested. It's supposed to be the ones that are material to what? To your claim or the, or the defense. M material to the motion for summary judgment. Right. Right. So if you're only moving on one claim, it would just be the facts associated right. with that claim. And uh, you know, sometimes in complicated cases, it's hard to make them really short. But I think what they want is they want one fact per lot, per uh, numbered item, basically not long paragraphs with lots of facts in them. I've now, seen the them done in charts a lot um, because it, it, within the document mm -hmm. it, it uh, will have the fact and why it's undisputed and it just it reads very well that it's just mm -hmm. like bullet points. Well, right. The judges have their own rules sure. okay. on what one fact means and what one sentence means because they're, they don't want people to try to gain leverage by using paragraphs and then having the uh, non-movement possibly able to refute part of it, but not another part and so on. And they'll send them back to you and tell you to rewrite it if you don't, if you don't do it right. Okay, so possibly the, the rule would be do what before you prepare your motion for summary judgment? Read the rule. Read the rule. Yeah. Call, call, the, call the clerk, law clerk, or the staff attorney, say, hey, how do you do this document in your court? Never hurts. You, you, it's really, really good for the judge to get what they like to see, right? If you're moving for summary judgment. Do you have to cite in that document the supporting record for that fact? I do, and I think the answer is yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good idea. The rule doesn't say. I think so, does it? I think you I think it's a really good idea. I don't think you have to do it. You have to cite it somewhere. If it's not going to be in there, it has to be in your brief. So I've seen it. I've seen it two ways. I've seen people do the statement of facts with all the supporting record, and then in the brief. They just reference this SOF paragraph number, which of course is a two-level determination by the court. If they're reading the brief and they say, I don't know about that fact, then they have to go to the other document and then they have to look at the record. And by, then I've also just seen the facts as listed and then all, all the records cited in the brief. Uh, frankly, the latter way is the way I grew up being taught to do it. And it may be because the rule, the Superior Court rule, does not say you have to cite the record. Statement. Now, how about response to? Do you have to respond item by item to a statement of material facts made by the movement? Yeah. It doesn't say you have to. It does not say you have to. Apparently, you think you should. I think you should. Yeah. 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 What if you? What if you agree to all the facts, or you don't care about them, but there's one fact that makes all the difference that you can test? Can you just list in your response? The light, you know, let's say the plaintiff is saying the light was red, and your response is the light was green, and you cite the record. Yeah, but the others will be deemed admitted if we don't contest them with material evidence. Yeah, so it's pretty dangerous if, you do, if you're, not, you're not really serious about con, uh, conceding those facts. Okay. So you can either go line by line based on the way they drafted their facts, which is one way of doing it, or you can cite the facts the way you want to do it and cite the record, which would contradict what they're saying. Right. Uh, because obviously the movement will often craft the facts in the exact way they want the story to unfold. And you might not want the story to unfold that way at all. Yeah. You can say so, admitted uh, but not material. Um, yeah, you can do that. Or, or uh, I guess you can't say material but not admitted. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> uh, okay. Uh, and then the, there's no requirement of the non-movement to state uh, theories of defense. 
So this is mainly an, an effort to whittle down the facts that are in contest. Um, but don't forget to do that. Certainly don't forget to cite your uh, your responsive evidence because I have had uh, I have a, I have taken over a case or come in after a mess made by a, a litigant who made all the perfect arguments, discussed all the perfect facts. This didn't happen to be in federal court. Did not have a statement of material facts in dispute, and the judge said, "Well, there's no document here. Everything made by the everything submitted by the movement movement is the facts. I'm granting judgment on everything in favor of the movement." So it's almost like a default uh, motion for summary judgment, even though the responsive brief set out all the facts that were kind of call your you know carrier. <laughs> yes. Federal court is very strict on that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, was there anything else on that, Todd? No, we covered it. Okay, thank you all very much for coming. As always. Yeah.